Farmer Jesse here, starting to rain. I shot this video twice already, and it was my usual, just kind of like wandering around the garden, babbling. Not good enough for this subject. So today, we're gonna take our time, we're gonna talk about soil health, and kind of the steps or the path you need to take to get there. So let's do it. First things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Here's the thing. Soil health is a complicated subject. I don't have a monopoly on all the good advice or good ideas. That is where you come in. Leave your insight, your input down in the comment section. What's worked for you, what hasn't, what I miss. So add those in the comment section. Let's get into it. What makes soil health important is a lot of things. Soil health is important because you want consistent crops. You want them to be as disease and pest resistant as possible. You want them to produce the healthiest, nutri most nutritional food you possibly can. And all those things come from soil health. Soil health, healthy soil also stays put. Healthy soil sequesters more carbon, uh, has a greater biodiversity. Uh, it's a lot of reasons to want soil health. Soil health is also kind of the primary goal of no-till agriculture. The whole reason that we want to not till or not turn over the soil, not disturb it, is to improve soil health. That's what we're gonna be talking about today, and the first kind of step, first thing you need to be doing, need to be thinking about, is what's in your soil. You need to test it. You need to do a soil test. Now, these are imperfect. Um, there's a lot of variables. Uh, how you take the test, what you take the test with, what time of year, there's a lot of variables. But it does give you kind of an indication of what's in your soil. So it's a good place to start. And I've heard before, and from Dr. Elaine Ingham and others, that there, all the minerals that you need are already in your soil, right? Um, this actually kind of makes some sense. If you think about how volcanoes erupt, they shoot minerals into the air, those travel around the globe and they drop onto soils all over. So that's one way that they get kind of transported. Another way is like the Sahara Desert literally just blew across the Atlantic Ocean. That's another way. Um, ancient oceanic activity and, I, and glacial activity have all contributed to a number of minerals being in your soil. That doesn't mean they're accessible though. So it need, you need to think about maybe adding, balancing your soil with that soil test, taking some recommendations, going through like a, a lab like Logan Labs is the one we use. They do the Albrecht soil test method. Um, Kinsey Ag Services is another one. There's several of them. Um, go through one of those labs and get their recommendations on what kind of minerals you need and how much of each. Some of the minerals and nutrients that you're going to be lacking can be accessible from your own farm. This is part of like what makes KNF, Korean Natural Farming, so exciting is that Master Cho has kind of developed a system for gathering all the fertilizer you'll need off of your own farm. So that includes phosphorus and calcium, nitrogen, uh, all the indigenous microorganisms, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, everything off your farm. So it's really cool. Look at Chris Trump's videos. He's done a great job. Shadam is another book that you can look at. Um, it's more about pest and disease management, but also has a lot of those in indigenous microorganisms thing. And so there's also a book coming out through Chelsea Green on that exact subject in August. I mentioned a second ago that some of your those nutrients may be in your soil, but they may not be accessible. Part of that has to do with compaction. Addressing compaction, no matter if you're in the beginning of your garden or 20 years into it, is a really important thing. This is a layer that's maybe caused by tillage or by rainfall or footsteps, whatever it's caused by. It's there and it's preventing the roots and the microbes from getting into your soil deep enough to access all the nutrients that are available, that you need, are already in your soil. So addressing compaction can be a really important part of starting a no-till garden or um, keeping a no-till garden improving. So just not tilling may not be good enough to get to adequate photosynthesis very fast. So this can be done with a broad fork, can be done with a subsoiler, can be done with well-timed tillage in the very beginning of a garden. Um, it can be done when you add compost and then till it in, in the very beginning. If you've been no-tilling for a while and you don't feel like that's a necessary step, Maybe not. Maybe a light broad forking in areas that seem like they're compacted, that you can't penetrate very easily with your hands or with like a piece of rebar or something. You can get something like a penetrometer, maybe like your local extension agent has one and you can measure, literally measure the compaction and where the layers are. If they're super expensive, you probably are not going to go buy one. I'm not going to go buy one. They're expensive. But either way, compaction has to be addressed for your plants to properly photosynthesize. And that word photosynthesis, let's just pause on that for a second. We all remember that one, right? Carbon dioxide's in the air. Plants take in the carbon dioxide, they separate the oxygen from the carbon, release the oxygen, pump the carbon into the soil. Microbes come and eat that carbon. It's like a little like sugar drink. That's their food source. They bring minerals in exchange for it. Other org organisms eat those microbes and 
release it, poop it out, in a plant soluble form. So the plants can actually access those minerals through that cycle. That's what photosynthesis is and it's super important, right? You need plants taking carbon dioxide out of the air and turning it into oxygen so that we have something to breathe. But you also need that pump, carbon pumped into the soil so we don't have excesses of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but also so that microbes have something to eat. And I should also say that we talked a lot about photosynthesis with John Kempf, in our podcast episode, but you can check that out as well. I'll put that link up here. And can you address compaction biologically? Yes, to an extent. Um, things like tillage radish, daikon radish, uh, you plant those in the fall, they grow over the winter, they produce like a really heavy, hefty root. Um, that root dies in the spring, or you may have to kill it if you're in a more warmer climate. Um, but you kill it or it dies, and then it rots and it keeps, it sort of separates the soil. However, um, that particular one is kind of hard in really dense clays. It doesn't like soil that doesn't drain very well. So that may not be an option for everybody. However, you can use a combination of different uh, cover crops to help break up compaction anyway. So maybe you're using a little daikon, maybe a little turnip or something, but you're also using things like rye and vetch and things with really deep tap roots as well um, that will help break it up over the winter time. So cover crops are a good option. Biological sort of decompaction is, a, is definitely an option. Speaking of biological decompaction, uh, let's talk about keeping stuff planted. You wanna keep stuff planted as much as possible. Like not only do you want annual crops in here, but you want cover crops and you want a little bit of interplanting where it makes sense. Um, you want as much photosynthetic activity as possible to help feed your soil, feed those microbes. Those microbes are dying, living and dying, so building up your soil organic matter at all times. The roots are living and dying. All of those things are good. That's all good for creating healthy soil. You want as much photosynthesis as possible. And how about the addition of microbes? This is an important one too. Biological amendments such as compost teas, uh, compost, good well-made compost, inoculating composts, um, the KNF style and indigenous microorganism composts. I really like those. Any of that, especially in with plants, uh, cover crops or whatever you have, um, those are great. Those can be really, really effective. Using those can help bring in diversity to your soil and just generally help to get it to a healthier place. I think so, in, in, corp, in terms of the biological element too, like adding some sort of biological stimulants, uh, kelp, azomite, uh, humic acid, fulvic acid, these things that actually sort of stimulate the behavior in the microbes that, that they need to be able to sort of get the minerals out of your soil that your plants need. I think one really underrated element of this and one that's a huge part of no-till agriculture is just keeping the soil mulched in some capacity as much as you possibly can. Um, mulch decreases compaction, gives microbial habitat, gives habitat for fungi, uh, not the mycorrhizal fungi necessarily, but things like saprophytic fungi that actually decompose carbonaceous, linen material, and release the nutrients that are trapped inside of it. So you want the mulch to help keep the moisture in and all those other things um, as much as possible because that, that will reduce your need for water, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, it will also, yeah, help feed your soil and feed your plants. So that can be compost, it can be straw, it can be wood chips, it can be a mixture of all of these, it could be hay, uh, it could be a little bit of peat moss just in spots that have um, that have a little bit of uh, bare soil like I, I show you in this little clip. If you're wondering what that is, that's the Lanzi compost peat moss spreader and yes, I'll do a video about it at some point soon. But yeah, keeping it covered. That's why it's a guiding principle to no-till agriculture. Keep the soil covered, keep the soil planted, and disturb it as little as possible. Those are like the three guiding principles of no-till agriculture for a reason. Water is also super important, and water is also super difficult. Um, wells can be great, but wells can also be contaminated with nitrates and phosphates and all these other things. Spring water can be great, but it can also be contaminated. Uh, Pond water, same thing. Filtration systems are important if you have them. And if you have any good advice for a good inline filtration system for county water or any sort of water, put that in the comment section because I'm sure people would be interested in that, especially high volume filtration systems. I don't think there's enough information out there about those and I don't know enough about them. Dry farming is also an option in, in climates that get enough rainfall, like it's literally raining a little bit right now. Yeah, I mean, where you can use rainfall or rainwater, great, but you know, for some of us that may not be possible. Um, try and use the best water you can, non-chlorinated, non-chloraminated, that's a word. You don't want all those antimicrobials in the water that you're putting on your microbially rich garden if you can help it. I also want to encourage you uh, to use the least amount of intervention possible, especially even the organic stuff, uh, fungicides like copper, um, any sort of pesticides like 
BT and those sorts of things because they deplete and decrease the population of biology and you want to increase the diversity of biology in your system. Um, that's what's going to create healthy soil. But as you, if you're using those, that means that next year it's just going to come back because you haven't increased the biological help that you need, you've decreased it. So I encourage you to trial that, maybe in small amounts or just you know, don't get yourself in danger by losing crops if you don't feel like you can. But for us, we've entirely stopped spraying, entirely stopped uh, using any sort of uh, pesticides, any of that stuff, BT, Pyganic, any of that. Um, because we want to encourage beneficials, because when you spray BT on something, you're killing your lace wings as well as your cabbage moths. It's not just your good, it's not just your bad guys, you're killing your good guys too. So you want to use as absolutely as little of that as possible. And in fact, encouraging those creating habitat for the beneficials, creating habitat for birds and birdhouses, um, doing things that will help you in a situation that maybe a plant got into the ground at the wrong time, maybe the ground wasn't prepped perfect, or maybe it had a little bit of compaction, so it doesn't take off right away, right? It may have some disease and pest pressure. It's good to have some outside help to help you kind of just give that plant a chance. It's an underrated thing that I don't think gets talked about enough is that plants just sometimes need a chance. They come out of the greenhouse, maybe it was too hot in the greenhouse, or maybe the soil mix just wasn't right, um, and they need a little bit of a boost. They need a chance. So part of that is just encouraging as many beneficials as you possibly can. Yeah. And the last thing I'll add is just be observant. Um, you will get pests, you will still get diseases, they will still happen, even if you follow all the rules perfectly. And that's actually kind of a good thing, because when you start a garden, you have this giant landscape to figure out. But as you narrow it down, as crops succeed in certain spots and fail in other spots, you can figure out where your problem areas are and sort of work on those. You know, maybe that involves getting a refractometer, which measures your bricks level, your sugar levels in your plants, and that'll help tell you, you know, how well it's photosynthesizing. Um, or maybe that's just looking for taking soil tests where you get disease issues um, or pest issues and doing sap analysis if you want to go that far. Yeah, anyway, like this video if you like this video. Leave your input and insight below. What did I miss? What have you learned? Subscribe to this channel. Kick us a few bucks on Patreon or Venmo if you got it. Um, thanks, you all. We'll see you all later.